Um, she's a behavioral pediatric neurologist and assistant professor in pediatric and pediatric neurology and psychiatry at UCLA um, and at CART. At, after completing a combined BA MD program at the at George Washington University of Medicine Health Sciences, Dr. Bott completed residency in pediatrics and child neurology at UCLA Mattel Children's Hospital, as well as behavioral neurology fellowship at CART and the Geste Lab. Dr. Bott's con, uh, current research interests, interests are focused on better evaluating and understanding motor function and how it's related to the social communication in children with neurodevelopmental disabilities. Dr. Bott is currently modifying current standardized assessments and utilizing new technology to better capture the uh, um, variability in motor function in children with neurodevelopmental disorders and 215Q syndrome with the goal of developing more targeted interventions. Please welcome Dr. Bott. Thank you, Vanessa. So this worked out well. You guys are all caffeinated now. You've had a bathroom break, so nice and attentive for the talk. Um, so as Vanessa said, I'm going to be talking about motor function in, um, in DUP15Q, something that I am very passionate about and have been studying for some time now. So quickly, Overall, what we're going to talk about is what we know about motor function, Duke 15 q syndrome, its relationship to other developmental domains, overall development, measures that we've been using to capture motor function, more refined measures that we'd like to use, and then thinking a little bit about how we can tie these measures from the preclinical model to the clinical models. So what do we know about motor function? Uh, we all know that motor delays um, and abnormalities are prevalent in DUP15Q. They're pervasive. Essentially, almost every child that we meet with both, both interstitial and isodicentric DUP15Q, as you can see from this chart, has either hypotonia or global developmental delays or other specific uh, delays in developmental milestones. Um, and often, actually, it's the first sign or symptom leading to a diagnosis. So from what we heard from the parent panel yesterday, a lot of these kids first presenting with hypotonia in the neonatal intensive care unit, feeding difficulties, apneas, and that's often what we see in our clinic as well. Um, as we've seen patients diagnosed as early as three weeks of age and even six weeks of age due to their hypotonia. And we also know that there's a strong association in DUP15Q between motor skills or motor impairments and overall development. So language, social communication, and adaptive functioning. And we know that largely because of a study that we did here at UCLA, uh, which Dr. DeStefano is going to highlight a little bit more later um, and publish a study looking at the developmental profiles of children with DUP15Q. So here you can see some of the measures that we used. Um, up in the left corner is the Mullen scales of early learning, a measure of overall development and cognition. And within that, uh, this direct assessment, there are also um, assessment of gross motor function and fine motor. And this is largely using acquisition of developmental milestones. So did the child crawl? Did they walk? Are they grasping? Are they transferring? And then next to that, you see the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale, which is a caregiver report, also includes gross and fine motor domains, along with other things such as daily living skills and communication. So when we looked at both of these and compared DUP15Q children with non-syndromic autism, not surprisingly, we saw that children with DUP15Q showed significant delays in gross and fine motor uh, compared to the non-syndromic autism. And then when we went ahead and compared those measures and looked at group-wise comparisons, we saw that in DUP15Q there was a strong relationship between motor skills and overall social communication and adaptive functioning, something that wasn't seen in the non-syndromic autism group. So then we move over to this measure uh, here in the corner, which many more of us are familiar with, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Scale. And what we saw is that all of our kids with DUP15Q met criteria for autism, but they showed sort of a relative strength in isolated social communication. So here you can see highlighted with the two stars, responsive social smile and facial expression. So that led our group essentially to hypothesize that with this strong relationship between motor skills and social communication and adaptive functioning, um, and that this kind of relative isolated interest in social communication, it could be perhaps that these kids meet criteria for autism spectrum disorder, but their early motor delays, this hypotonia, this delay in developmental milestones, is really inhibiting them from acquiring social communication or engaging with their peers. So before we move on to how we looked into that a little bit further, let's talk about why this is important. So as you can see now just from these first couple of slides, motor function in DUP15Q in general can be observed. It can be measured with some of these measures that we've already highlighted. 
These abnormalities also manifest very early, and they're strongly associated with overall development. And we can likely say that these motor abnormalities actually precede some of these social communication deficits, yielding us the opportunity to measure these early and think about interventions that could potentially improve overall development. So that kind of highlights into point three and four, which I hope to further show is that motor function can be used as a target for intervention. We do have interventions that have been developed, occupational, physical therapies, and can also be used as a marker of change over time. And then lastly, I do want to talk about, especially in light of our group, just thinking about how motor measures can really be translated from the preclinical to the clinical model. Um, so as we continued on our study of DUPE15Q, uh, I was tasked and had the ability to really add on or think about other measures of motor function. And so moving from the Mullen scales of early learning that you saw, which largely focuses on developmental milestone acquisition, I decided to use the movement assessment battery for children. So this is a standardized assessment and it starts looking at motor domains. So as you can see here, there's about eight individual test items and they group things in manual dexterity, aiming and catching, and balance skills. There are some qualitative observations as well, but these are not scored. And the manual tells us it takes about 20 to 30 minutes, but in reality with our Do15Q kids, it takes up to an hour if not longer, if you ask some of the assessors. So let's watch a couple of components of the movement assessment battery. So this is the posting coins portion, which is looking largely at manual dexterity. So that's one kiddo. Let's watch the other kiddo before we talk about it. Do you guys notice any differences between the kids or their abilities? Right, yeah. we see we some, right? That's a good, thank you. Thank you, clinician. I, don't, I think both are clinicians and, <laughs> yeah. So we see in the first video, this kiddo here, he's able to get all the coins in. There's some difficulty with grasping the coin though, right? And the way in which he holds it, gets it into the slot. And then our second kiddo, clearly we can see she had a lot of difficulty getting that in. And even in her second and third trial, when she was a little happier, she really just couldn't get the coin within there. So what I'll, She was, so that's why I was mentioning that exactly, but in um, subsequent trials where she was a little bit more comfortable, still couldn't quite get the coin into, into the slot. But exactly, even distress during that, right? Uh, but what I will tell you is when we went back and scored this, both of these kids scored exactly the same on the movement assessment battery. So they both scored in this particular portion at the lowest range of their age band. So the, that got me thinking, why don't I start looking at some of these videos or the overall tests? And when I started looking at this age band, what I noted is that all of our participants scored at the lower range, so at the first percentile of the, of this, um, of the overall MABC. So I started wondering, why is that the case? Clearly we can see from the videos that there's clear differences between these kids. And so I went back and watched all of their videos. And what I found is, although a majority of the participants were able to complete a lot of the individual test items, they scored very low because of their inability to stay attentive to the tasks for multiple trials, uh, for their inability to complete the tasks in an allotted time, which is what the movement assessment battery requires, that it's within 30 seconds or within one minute. And a large component of it was that many of the kids couldn't understand the tasks we were asking of them. Uh, so we really couldn't include demonstrations per the guide and the children weren't understanding what we were asking. Regardless of that, even though that we saw that many of them hit that floor effect, we did start uncovering some themes in our DUPE15Q children that were differentiating them from the kids that were studying with just intellectual disability without DUPE15Q. And what that was is, in the manual dexterity portion, all of the kids had difficulty in grasping and gripping both the coins, the pen, and the pencil. Uh, actually, none of our participants could catch 
Even that first video that you saw, interestingly enough, they would engage the assessor, they would anticipate that they were gonna throw, recognize that, and when the beanbag was actually thrown, none of them could fully anticipate it. They either reached their hands too early or too late, which really got me thinking about whether this is a motor planning difficulty that they're having rather than just a fine motor or gross motor skill. And then lastly, the balance. None of them could complete the balance portion of this, and they even had difficulty in balance and gait. And this example down at the bottom is just one more of that first video that you saw. This is one of the manual dexterity portions. It's called the bicycle trail. A child has to take a pen, start at the beginning of it, trace this entire line without lifting up the pen and without moving outside of the lines. And if they hit 12 errors, they again get a zero score. So I'm not even sure I could trace that entire thing, but as you can see, he received a zero score as well. Can I ask, is, is there another test? I mean, obviously you've got some issues. Yeah. You know, you can't, this, this motor test is probably for kids that have just motor problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I feel like I planted you. That's per exactly. That's so. Yes, uh, we do have better tests. Uh, yeah. And so, exactly what Larry was saying is that a lot of the, uh, a lot. I know he told you to be quiet, but now you can talk now. That's okay. Uh, is that a lot of these assessments aren't made for kids with cognitive difficulties? or profound motor delays, right? They're really used to start differentiating just some kids with motor delays or high-risk infants, premature infants. So what we did before we kind of start talking about other tools that we can use is I went back and recoded all those videos and highlighted modifications that we can make to really refine what we're seeing in these kids. So modifications in which we can help them hold their preferred hand versus non-preferred hand when they have to do these tasks. Um, and regards of allotting them more time, including demonstrations, things that other measures are starting to use to study populations of non-syndromic ASD, uh, autism spectrum disorder, but also things that we can use in this population. And as we're moving forward, what we're doing now is systematically coding it and developing what I'd like to think of sort of a dupe 15 q movement assessment battery for children. Uh, but now you've seen sort of the Mullen scales of early learning, which is looking at developmental milestones. And another ref refined tool, or I, what I thought was more refined, which was the movement assessment battery for children. Um, but what are we still missing from this? And clearly we've highlighted some of those things is that all of these kids hit the floor, right? So we're really missing that richness. We're missing their individual impairments and strengths or the variability. And we're sort of, like I said, capturing developmental milestones and skill acquisition. So can they walk, can they not walk? Can they insert a coin, can they not? But we're missing quantifying those more qualitative descriptions. So as a pediatric neurologist, if you tell me a child can walk or can't walk, I'm sort of thinking one thing, but if I see that child and you describe to me that they're asymmetric or they're rigid or they have a wide base, I'm gonna start thinking about what are the other mechanisms that could be at interplay. Is this cerebellar? Is this striatal? And as I understand those mechanisms and I understand that circuitry, that's gonna help me start identifying and hopefully at large identifying what more specific interventions we can do to target those mechanisms and improve these children. So as I started searching for more refined measures, and hopefully this can speak to some of our mouse model people here, I went back to the preclinical models to see what we're using there. And this study, which uh, one of the authors was one of our speakers, Dr. Kumi, yesterday, uh, looked at cerebellar circuitry at large, but also utilized two specific motor tasks, an eye blink and then a gait analysis. So I'm gonna focus here on the gait analysis because I felt that that was clinically sort of feasible to translate over to our patients. So as you can see here, which as a clinician scientist, I find very cute, these mouse footprints. On one side, we see the do 15 q mouse. On the other, a wild type mouse. Already from the photo, you can see that the Dupe 15 q mouse has wider steps. So these bolded and dashed lines are indicating step width and step length. And what, uh, what they used to analyze these kinematic variables was this digigate imaging treadmill. So it's a mouse essentially in a plexiglass structure on a continuously moving treadmill with a mount, uh, excuse me, a, a camera mounted underneath the plexiglass structure. And then from using those, that um, video, they can derive some of these kinematic variables that you see here. So what did these researchers found in this particular mouse model? They found that the Dupe 15Q mouse used a wider stance, indicating possibly less stability. 
a longer duration of propulsion. So propulsion is a measure of acceleration. So as you move forward, that mouse was going a little bit slower using a longer duration indicating maybe reduced strength and a reduced stride frequency also. So indicating kind of global motor difficulties. So now let's think about this in our clinical population. So many of you guys have heard that in this family meeting we did some pretty uh, diligent a collection and assessments. So all of this data that we're now gonna get into is as of about two days ago. So we're gonna be parsing this. I tried my very best in the last 12 hours along with our protokinetics team, which we'll talk about to get this out to start looking at this. So we did have an entire motor assessment area, which for me was awesome. We did, I did about, I think close to 50 neurologic exams, which as a clinician and pediatric neurologist was fantastic from a learning opportunity um, and getting a better idea of what these patients present with from age nine months to 41 years of age. Um, and then we had about uh, 45 participants or so walk across this gate mat. And in addition to that, I also asked that siblings walk across, one to start collecting some normative data, but also for my interest to see if we kind of see a broader motor phenotype between siblings as well. So with the help of the protokinetics team who is here today, who generously gave us a gate mat to use for this meeting, um, this mat is a three-layer system, and within there, there's sensors. So as a child walks across this, we'll look at this, it starts deriving some of those kinematic variables as well. So let's first look at a typically developing sibling participant, okay? So first, I want you guys to focus on the video, then we'll talk about some of the other parameters around there. You can see her walking. Down below here, we see her footsteps. This green line is the center of mass that you see fairly stable. And as we start looking up here, and I'll replay this one more time, this is really indicating her left foot fall and her right foot fall in the center of pressure. So you sort of see that center of pressure go from the heel all the way to the toe. And right next to it is something we call a psychogram. So what's that showing is, again, that center of pressure from a single stance moving from your heel to your toe, which is the uh, horizontal lines. And then the vertical lines is showed, so showing that forward projection of that. So as you see her footsteps, uh, footsteps excuse me, fall one in front of the other and moving forward, okay? Let's look at her sister, who is about one year age in difference. So already clinically, you can kind of see her gait, right? She's a little bit more wide-based. You can see that in her footsteps down below here. Her center of mass kind of deviates a little bit, stays a little more stable. And what's interesting to me also is when you look at her pressure of footfall, you're not seeing that same heel-to-toe pressure, right? You're seeing more of this pressure that's kind of waddling from side to side which can really be depicted nicely in this psychogram, that instead of seeing that beautiful sort of hourglass figure, what we're seeing is, and I'll, you know, us gate motor people really like to depict this, but rather than going like this, which you expect a normal gait, you're seeing her kind of go like this, all right? So let's look at how these actual variables look and how it sort of translates or projects onto similar to our mouse model. So as you can go back over here to the left-hand side, you see some of our figures. In the dupe 15 q mouse, similar to the dupe 15 q patient, you see wider steps. You see somewhat reduced steps over in this direction as well. And then let's look at the actual variables that we see. So already you can see that the typically developing sibling, over all the way in the right, is the normative values for four to five years of age. The typically developing sibling is looking much similar to those normative values than her sister, who's about a year older. And I should have used months here, but the do 15 q participant had just turned five. The sibling was about to be four, so still a year age, but not that much of a difference. So let's start looking at those variables. In velocity, we already saw that the do 15 q participant is much slower. So that rate of moving forward is slower, kind of similar to what we saw in that mouse model. That rate of acceleration is, is slower. Uh, the step length is less as well. The cadence, which is the rate at which the overall speed that you're going also is slower in the, in the Duke 15 q patient. The stride width, which we saw over here, both in the mouse model and the patient, is much wider in our Duke 15 q patient. And then that last variable is what I was talking about, that center of pressure, as we saw from heel to toe. 
And what we see is the percent of time that the Duke 15 Q participant spends from heel to toe is much less on both feet compared to the typically developing. And a clinician, for me, what's interesting is actually what you see is she spends even less time on her right foot. So as I really start thinking about her specifically, why is she using that right foot less? Is that something that we need to think about from an intervention perspective? Is that a palsy that she's showing for some reason? Is that typical of Duke 15 Q? So we're seeing this in these two participants, but now let's look at some of these variables in a lot of our participants. So this is all the participants that walked over the first two days, includes about 37 uh, participants. And when we start looking at these categories, let's kind of step back because again, there's still a lot of work to be done on this, but at least see some of the trends that we're seeing. So overall cadence, the rate of which you're walking is lower in our Duke 15 Q participants. Uh, the step length is reduced. The stride width is much uh, bigger. And so let me go back and orient you actually. The blue bars are the Duke 15 Q patients. The green, the normative data. And then the uh, actual black bars are showing the standard deviation, plus or minus one, indicating sort of our intersubject variability within participants. So you can also see that the Duke 15 Q patients across the board are much more variable. Other things that we're seeing is, in general, across ages, so we've binned them by age, and then I put them all next to each other in hopes to start looking at somewhat of a developmental trajectory. What we're seeing is that the Duke 15 Q patients are staying delayed across the board. And also, in areas in which, for example, the six to eight years of age of Duke 15 Q participants is looking more like the three to five year age of our normative data, okay? So these are some general trends that we're seeing. When we look at this also though, other trends that we're seeing is that uh, typically with normative age, your cadence or your rate of which you walk is much faster at a younger age, that should reduce as you get older. We're seeing that in both groups. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about this enhanced global variability index after we talk about the next slide, which is looking at the variability in all gate parameters um, for these subjects. So the other task that um, I developed and asked the gate people if we could use is balance and stability. Something that we saw in the movement assessment battery that was difficult for all of these participants. And some of you might know, or as we talk about the clinicians, um, a lot of our other pediatric neurologist counterparts like traumatic brain injury, things like that, use these balance boards. And I believe actually in past Duke 15Q meetings, there was some attempt to use some balance boards. But again, what we are really facing is that none of the participants could do it. It takes some cognitive ability. It's hard to get on the balance board. So because we have the sensors on this gate mat and we're able to see the center of pressure, I posed to the protokinetics team, can we do balance on that? It doesn't take much cognitive ability. How can we measure it? And of course, they were able to come up with a way to do that. So essentially for the task, we had the participants stand in place. Then we had them lift up one foot and then the other foot. And what was nice about this is they didn't have to lift it up continuously for 15 to 30 seconds, which is what other assessments asked. They could lift it up, come back down, lift it up, come back down, and we could still see what the overall center of pressure is. So in this graph, the blue area is the entire area that they cover as they're trying to balance. So we then drew a circle around 95% of that area. And what you see is the bigger the circle, the larger the area, and the longer the circle, the less stable an individual is. So here on the left side, you have a 20-year-old Duke 15 Q patient. And on the right, you have a typically developing 21-year-old. And what you see is that their area is 10 times bigger and their length of center of uh, pressure is 2.5 times bigger. So these participants are less stable, and they're trying to generate more pressure in order to remain stable overall. So kind of moving back over to here and what I say when we parse apart this data, when we look at this balance task and we look at these gate parameters and we look at this overall variability, we see that Duke 15 q patients are overall significantly more variable, and that could mean many things. One, it could just be that we tested a lot of different participants across the age range. We do also see that there's many different manifestations of Duke 15Q. But I think what's important as I look at this data further is that we do need to parse it apart by um, duplication type, epilepsy, no epilepsy, and also cognition. Because we've seen in non-syndromic ASD that children who, have, who are more cognitively delayed or more severe intellectual disability are showing more profound motor delays also. And then I also think it would be nice and important as we move forward, and these gate mat was used recently in the Angelman meeting, 
is comparing our dupe 15 q kiddos to other genetic syndromes that manifest with hypotonia. So we can really get an idea that what are the more specific things to dupe 15 q and you know, what might be different or what might them parse apart from these other genetic syndromes. But I will say, I think we are at least beginning to shed some light developmentally, what we see in these kids, that they remain delayed over time. Um, some variables of stability, which could likely be rooted in their hypotonia as well. And now we can parse apart this data further to see if we're seeing a specific phenotype in do 15 q patients. So to round out, um, as I keep searching for even more refined measures that we can use, I showed you some upper extremity data, I showed you some gait data, but we also need to take these patients as a whole, right? What are they doing in full body movements and in posture as well? So we had develop, we had acquisition of early developmental milestones, we looked at skill acquisition, we now looked at a more refined measure of gait, and now another thing that I'm working on here is with our motion capture analysis lab at UCLA, where it creates 3D imaging using reflective, passive reflective markers that go on the kiddos. So the reflective markers are actually pretty easy. They're sticky markers, they can go on clothing, most kids tolerate these very well. And so I'll show you this and then we'll talk about sort of the other aspect. This is one of our participants walking. The red line here is the heel trajectory. Here you can see the full body arm swing. You can see the legs. I'm wrapping up rounds. You can also even see sort of head movements as you look at this. And then I'll just kind of quickly, I won't go over these red lines are sort of heel strikes that we're seeing, starting to look at gait parameters, and these are gait cycles. Now, one thing you can notice, I just want to highlight, those are a lot of markers, right? So how many of our Dupe 15 q kids or any of our autism kids going to tolerate the time to put on 57 markers to get this data? Probably not any of them, and from personal experience, they don't. <laughs> So I'm working with a couple of um, really brilliant people here, along with Dr. Dickinson, who's here, who I'll highlight, uh, to reduce these markers down and still capture accurate um, motion data. Don't they wear, like, uh, body so they can. They can. So in the in 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 a, in a, in a oh, what was that? Sorry. It's one body suit. You get a minute, it's got all the markers on it. So it's so actually. The bodysuits that have the markers in them, uh, which I've looked at a little bit, don't have the most refined parameters of motion. And so my goal, taking that into account, because exactly, if you could just put on a suit and get some sensors, and this is really trying to think about how we can get data, but how we can get good data, right? What are we really seeing here? So in speaking to a lot of the scientists who do this, a lot of people who process this data, they say, that's not really great data. So then I moved back over to this motion capture analysis and said, okay, this is better data, but that's 57 markers, what's feasible? So what we're working on now is we've collected a lot of data using the 57 markers, and now we're using MATLAB to slowly reduce marker by marker and make sure we're still getting accurate data. And actually, just last week, we came back and met, we're down to 14 markers to look at just purely gait and about 22 to look at whole body. And these suits also come in multiple child sizes. So these children with, I've had a variety of children with ASD come in as young as four years of age. They love the suits as long as you put a cape on them and maybe a little sign that says Superman or Batman. And the reflective markers 14 take maybe five to 10 minutes to put on. They run around the room and they love looking at these avatars that are created of them. So we're now just trying to develop really refined whole body measures as well. All right. so, I'll wrap up now, sorry Vanessa, and kind of going back to some of these points that are important, but really what have we seen here? Motor function is important, right? It's tied into overall development, and I'll go as far to say that if you have significant delays in motor, you're not gonna develop language, you're not gonna develop independence, you're not gonna develop adaptive skills, areas that a lot of our parents emphasized yesterday that are important, right, for us to target. So, as, and we need more refined measures, right? So we have acquisition of developmental milestones, of skills, but now using this gate mat, using this motion capture analysis, we're seeing more individual differences and in specificity to these motor impairments. And as we understand this and start interrelating that with neural mechanisms, we can start developing interventions that hopefully can be used in preclinical models 
that translate over to clinical models as well. So with that, I quickly, because I have to at least thank multiple people, not in any specific order, but I really have to thank the protokinetics team who's here, who gave us the gate map for the Duke 15Q meeting, Michael Rowling, Yuan Chang, and their entire team who enabled us to look at this data in this quickly of a time. Um, and then my Duke 15Q motor team that I call them, particularly Sumana who's here, she received one of the student fellowships actually to attend the meeting, and Dr. Dickinson, a brilliant data analysis person from many different aspects who help, has helped me both with the motion capture and the gate data. Also want to thank Dr. Shafali Jeste. It was her about three, four years ago when I first said, as a Pete's Neuro Fellow, I want to come work with you. She said yes. I was started working in the Duke 15Q clinic, and she introduced me to these families and has mentored and supported many of these endeavors, which see, they've come to fruition in some way, Shivali. And then Scott and Carly, who've both been very helpful in the Just Day Lab. And then, of course, the Duke 15Q Alliance, Vanessa and Guy, and all of the families. I'll truly say, in these last few days during those neurologic exams, more than just collecting the motor data, hearing these individual journeys was absolutely incredible. And I thank the families for letting us be a part of their child's care. Thank you, guys. <laughs>